I know that you said that Fred Ramsey sent you to Moash. What was that meeting like, and what was your arrangement with him? Uh, I never, I, I, I finally in the late 80s, um, for, uh, we did actually, uh, for a period of some months, actually work for Folkways, but I never was employed by Folkways in all those other years. Um, Moash had a vision of human creativity, which was so large that it could contain all our other visions. So there I was associated with people like Langston Hughes. Um, Langston uh, was also associated with Mo in the same way that I was, Fred Ramsey, Harold Corlander. Uh, and he trusted us and because his concept contained ours. And so we would bring work to him. Uh, Fred, uh, Fred had, uh, I didn't know really even how to edit a tape. So when I did the, uh, the uh, I actually got to record the six and seven eight string band in the summer of uh, 54. Uh, I, I, I said, uh, Fred had returned to uh, New Jersey at that point. So I sent him the tapes and said, Fred, uh, what do I do? And so he edited the tapes for me. Then we came out on Folkways. That was the first thing that actually was released. So uh, he uh, he gave me an insight to how to do this. And with Folkways, and of course, uh, 52, I heard about the Harry Smith thing. I knew the other Folkways records. I, Folkways was our kind of our goal at that point. So uh, I had all these recordings, and I was thinking I would do a musical portrait of the music of New Orleans, which I did. It's a five-volume five, val five volume set that came out in Folkways in the 1950s, before the blues material. And, um, and Fred said, well, take, take the tapes up to Mo. So I was working in a car wash at that point. So for $150, I bought the car that was at the car wash and was three different colors of something or other. So I sort of painted it a fourth different color and set off. And it got me to New York uh, with uh, all the tapes in the back, a whole carton of them in the trunk. And I said to uh, Mo, uh, you know, I met Mo, a very gruff guy in this totally jammed office off of Times Square, 46th Street. And uh, I left him the, the, the box of tapes, and I sort of explained what I was going to do, and he kind of looked at me and said, I said, the next day, he said, come back tomorrow. So I went back the next day, and he looked at me and said, I'll put them out. And that was essentially our agreement. And each record was done individually. I'd bring him tapes, and 90% um, of the time he took them. There was never any censorship, never any editing, it, and the only consideration was whether it extended the horizon of human creativity, this documentation that Mo was attempting to create. So that uh, I've, I've even lost track of how many records I did with him, but uh, there were a lot. I mean, did you pitch projects and did he finance the trips or? Never, never. We did it and, uh, you know, uh, you get a hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, uh, royalties. Every everything is a trade-off. You can't cheat an honest man. You know, what was I getting from Moash? I was getting the opportunity to create something that I believed in and create it in my own way, since there was no consideration made for commercial potential, none. The other great great temptation was that it would stay in print forever. For my someone like myself who was concerned with documenting a culture that was being quickly lost. Uh, how could I say no? So, of course I worked for him. Uh, uh, it was difficult. I, in 1959, after I'd written that, that, in the spring of 59, I wrote The Country Blues. In the summer of 59, I wrote History of Jazz in New York City uh, for those two books. Then we were going to move to Europe. So we stopped in St. Louis, and we did four albums which I confidently expected Mo would pick up. $200 each was what I paid the artists, and uh, you know, that was, it wasn't much money. And Mo absolutely said, uh, no, sorry, sorry, can't do it. He didn't have the money. That was simple as that. It, it, Mo never did, uh, Mo was a complicated man, but if, uh, had there been money, uh, we would have had it. So with Mo, uh, you simply had to be prepared for the fact that uh, you weren't going to make much money, uh, or if you did. Dave Van Ronk and I lived together for a while in the 19, you know, in 58. When I, we 
we had a cold water flat above the folklore center in New York, and uh, Dave had done some records for Folkways, and he had a Folkways outfit of total rags he'd gotten in the Salvation mm -hmm. Army, and he would go up and say, Mo, I need some royalties. <laughs> and Mo would pick up whatever piece of paper he had in the desk and said, I just have a royalty statement, I owe seventy five dollars. So <laughs> it somehow kept us going. But you can understand having that kind of creative freedom was worth the other things we had to do. Plus, we believed in what Mo was doing. You know, just how could you not believe? What was a press run on a typical Folkways release? Do you have any idea? Well, <laughs> it's actually very easy to keep track of. Mo changed cover every thousand uh, uh, copies. He printed a thousand covers. And then uh, it would have the cover would uh, be either redesigned or printed with slightly different colors, or the you know just the, the, the printers could never match the the, the colors uh, from time to time. So the same album would appear over and over again uh, with slightly different colors. So every time there's different colors, another thousand. It, it, I think it was a wonderful uh, era in terms of just black stock jackets with you know the particulars slapped on. Yeah. Absolutely, and we could write. And as, as I as I wrote in the introduction to, uh, to Walking at Blues Road, that it was wonderful for me. In the one hand, because you could write at length. The other problem was that when I finally had to adjust to writing all those hundreds of liner notes I wrote for the other albums, I had to adjust the fact that I only had the space on the back of the album.